Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of There's a Will. I must say, you are looking good. And I have two excellent guests who also will be thinking good, which is more important on this show. Um, although we will have a swimsuit edition in the future um, for the ladies, with the ladies, um, for the men, and possibly for the ladies. Uh, my guests today on the show are uh, Ogierd Ujiembo, who's been a guest before. He's a professor, and he's so smart that he wrote a book in Chinese only because Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit did not have enough readers, and there are, of course, a billion Chinese. So welcome to the show. Ogierd, it's good to see you. I tell nice the truth. To meet you again. I tell the truth. I tell the truth, right? Yeah. That was not an, exactly a book. That was, that was just a thesis. <laughs> yeah, okay, a thesis anyway. Better than I could do. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we have Bruce Roberts, the CEO of the August Mission, a man who makes Captain America look inadequate, uh, who's, coming to us, <laughs> who's coming to us from, the, from Ukraine today. And uh, I think you're in Hemelnitsky, is that right? Yes, Bruce? Yeah. yes, central Ukraine, central Ukraine, dead in the center of the country. Right in the center. How long are you going to be out there? I'm getting towards the end of my trip now. Uh, the, the total trip was about three weeks, uh, but our organization is, is uh, committed to being here continuously and have a maintaining a presence. So you're going to be uh, coming back this way to Warsaw and then going back to the States. Is that right? Soon? That's correct. That's correct. Very soon, yeah, next yeah. week. Next week, yeah. Because I think that uh, I may be at the end of next week going that way. It depends. I've, I've got a trip kind of organized uh, with another, uh, with Rusty, you know, uh, who's been on the show before. And he, I think I told you about him, Davai Ukraine is his organization. And uh, thinking about going and doing next, and if I do, we'll do the next edition of this show from over there, yeah. Um, there's a lot in the news. I, I just want to say, there, of course, the abortion controversy, they've, they've had that in, in Poland. They've also had it, they're having it in the United States because of the, uh, uh, they've got rid of, uh, the Supreme Court has, has uh, nullified Roe v. v. Wade, which was an early 1970s decision about, about abortion. So people, this all, <laughs> This issue, which has been there for all of our lives, and anybody younger, the, uh, is, uh, is also pushing. I mean, I, look at, uh, I looked at the Drudge Report, which has the listings of all the different main stories. It's a collection, uh, for those who don't know, Drudge Report, um, international and American. But the first 15 stories are about Roe v be weighed, being overturned. And uh, so that's a big, big thing in the news. And of course, abortion was, uh, and abortion protests were huge in Poland. But the other thing that comes to mind, also from the United States, uh, we've got a lot to talk about Poland today because of what the Russians are saying. But uh, the other thing that, that's very interesting coming from the States right now is the fellow who wanted to shoot the Supreme Court justice showed up outside, was wandering around in the neighborhood with a gun, and then they asked him why, and he said, oh, I'm protesting gun violence. And that seems to be where, where a lot of the discussion is nowadays on a lot of these issues, totally emotional and almost completely irrational. We're living in very irrational times. It's just so contradictory, so many of these things. Even the war that we're looking at right now, uh, that you're doing such great work, and many people like you, Bruce, your, many people, organizations like yours, the August Mission, doing such great work and, and uh, selflessly, and uh, I suppose with an end game in mind of trying to keep the peace and keeping things from, stop suffering and keeping things from going further, right? Um, this is... Uh, Another absurdity and almost anti-rational. Anti when is war rational? Uh, I suppose when you're attacked. But uh, it certainly seems anti-rational that the Russians would be attacking uh, 
would be using authoritarian, rather fascist tactics to attack a democracy and then calling the that democracy, in fact, uh, uh, fascist. So it's, <laughs> it's it almost it almost defies the mind. It certainly ma makes you would make you get out the aspirin and start working your way through the bottle. Yeah. At any rate. It's headache time. We stopped off. Ogird, how are you doing? I just saw you yesterday, didn't I? Oh, yeah, you still remember. I, Bruce, I was sitting in Ogird's garden yesterday because I was in Bialystok for the travel show, Poland Daily Travel, and with Vova, my, my uh, friend and cameraman from Kiev, and uh, he says I can say Kiev. I don't have to say Kiev, which is very annoying as a word. I don't, I don't, I've never heard the, I think most Ukrainians, they say something in between Kiev and they don't say Kiev. I never heard that until the news people started saying it. But uh, now you can also try saying Kiev. Kiev? Now Kiev, I've heard, yeah. Well, Kiev is a Polish version. That, oh, right. Uh, that's where I heard it. <laughs> it's the Polish one. Okay. But, you know, we get so hung up on these pronunciations. I think what matters uh, is that people understand what you're saying, basically. The rest of the stuff is kind of virtue signaling. Um, yes. So, Bruce, why don't you tell us about what you've been doing for the last uh, few days uh, since we saw you. You were in the studio here in Warsaw last Saturday. Uh, what have you been doing since we saw you? Well, we've... Uh we've been moving humanitarian aid into the country we've got some warehouses uh and some relationships with those warehouses on the polish side in lublin uh established and uh they've been providing us with uh pallets of aid i think we moved about 32 pallets worth of aid in in the last week um and that's uh different types of you know there's blankets and clothing a lot of uh toiletries uh medical a lot of medical supplies and we've kind of adopted this oblast in this area because we've found that uh, the Melnitsky area is, is uh, pretty much a hub for people transiting either, both east to west and also west to east. So a lot of the refugees coming out, some of them coming back in. Homes are destroyed in the east. They don't necessarily have a place to go to. Uh, they end up displaced, and a lot of them have uh, settled here. The, the, in talking with the oblast governor, uh, which I did last week, uh, the numbers that they report of registered refugees are upwards of 100,000 in this area, and they went and they've gone as high as 200,000, and uh, the city itself is 250,000. So there are times when they've almost doubled the population of the city um, here with the uh, displaced persons um, population. So there's a lot to do here. Um, we've settled into a pretty regular schedule. Uh, we've got three hospitals that we support. Uh, we work with the city government uh, to supply some of their warehouses with um, humanitarian aid. Um, there's a couple of smaller cities. Uh, there's one that's pretty far, about two hours away. Another one, only 50 kilometers away, that we've we go out, we go out and support. There's a Catholic church uh, uh, south of here, or uh, in the town of Starkon. That's only half the name. I can't say the whole thing yet. Uh, that we've been providing with aid, and they they have their own distribution center for the refugees living in that area. So yeah, there's there's a lot to do, and I think there's there will be a lot to do uh, for the foreseeable future because um, they you know who knows when when the Ukrainians will be able to push the Russians out of the occupied territory. So some of these folks will never get their homes back. When you say you're supplying aid, what kind of aid are you supplying there, Bruce? Uh, you say it's humanitarian, but can you give, be more specific about the kind of stuff you're supplying? might be sure. useful to so, other people doing the same thing or trying to. We asked the question, right, like, what do you want? Um, we've, we've supplied mattresses for, for uh, uh, like, old people's homes uh, and other refugee centers. We've supplied washing machines, refrigerators. We obviously bring in food. Sometimes we'll just purchase the food locally uh, and, then, and then bring it so it's fresh. Uh, we also get a lot of... Uh, uh, storage type food or longer shelf life foods through the humanitarian channels that we'll bring. Uh, we, we get blankets, sleeping bags, some clothing items, well, that's not really what we focus on. Uh, a lot of it is uh, medical supplies, bandages. We've been able to get some uh, uh, over-the-counter uh, prescription drugs. Uh, we've, pro we've provided an ultrasound machine when it was asked for. 
Right now we're raising money for some respirators for the children's hospital because they, they only have two. So you say you're going to be, who's your, what's your, your operation look like on the ground there, Bruce? Because there are other people out there who are operating. They have a lot of challenges. Uh, there are certainly challenges with aid workers. Are you having any trouble with, with your aid workers, coordinating them, with them having PTSD, things like that? Um, you know, traditionally PTSD is higher than in, um, in aid workers than it is in soldiers. Uh, and maybe it's because they're less prepared to see what they see. I, I don't know. But uh, I wouldn't say that we've had cases of PTSD. We've definitely had um, a lot of emotional moments uh, for the, our folks that are working with us. We have about eight, eight people here on the ground right now. Uh, we own several trucks, box trucks, sprinter vans, and we've uh, secured warehouse space on the Polish side of the border and then also uh, a couple of spots in Ukraine so we can use that logistic supply chain to move humanitarian aid forward uh, to where we're at now and stage it for delivery to the uh, different hospitals and refugee centers um, that we have identified and are working with. Um, but yeah, we've had definitely a lot of emotional moments when people, when you know, you see a kid uh, your own kid's age, uh, you see an elderly person that reminds you of your parent um, living in deplorable conditions. Uh, it, uh, it hits you, hits you, hits you in, the, in the heartstrings, you know, sometimes, pulls on those heartstrings. Yes, because I, I heard this from some other people that they were having trouble. Uh, and I think we spoke about this, but not maybe not on camera last week, about the problems with some of the workers. How many people do you have working with you? And, and what is the makeup, are the Ukrainians, Americans, uh, uh, other nationalities? What does it look like in your organization, the amount and types of people, or where, th where they come from? Oh, sure, we have about eight people here forward. Um, one of them Ukrainian, uh, one of them Polish, uh, the rest are Americans, some Polish folks and Ukrainians we work with on a regular basis, both sides of the border here. Uh, and we've hired local Ukrainians to be a part of August Mission and to represent us. We establish our footprint and um, our logistics supply chain to be able to deliver more aid. We will help uh, people who know, uh, who know the people who speak the language and who are, are in uh, train, uh, rebuilt and in helping these people long term. And are you cooperating with other groups while you're there? Do you have cooperation with other groups there, Bruce? We do um, in, in this overall effort, but we, we haven't, uh, we're not cooperating with any other, uh, I would say, international NGOs here. Um, we are cooperating with some of the Ukrainian uh, uh, nonprofits or charity groups. There's um, one called Podia here. There's another one called Caritas. Um, and we are helping to support them, support their warehouses. Uh, sometimes we'll just pitch in um, some manpower to help moving things uh, and help supporting their efforts. Uh, we're also tied into the local, the city and local uh, state or oblast government um, and trying to support, let them know what, what we're doing and, and ask uh, the questions like what kind of needs can we specifically uh, support, what towns should we go to, what refugee centers should we look at. Um, trying to, and we also met the mayor here and, and we've, we've created that relationship and they're all very supportive of our efforts. Can yeah. I have a question? Yes, please, Augur, pitch in. Uh, because I, I, I'm in touch with some people about further in, further in the East, some of our Chinese, sinologists make up, make up a little of a, you know, Chinese-speaking network. And some of the people just got back to Irping, which is near Kiev, one of the most, uh, the, the cities that suffered most in, during the first part of the invasion. And there are reports that are actually worrying for me. Like, what control do you have of the, over the distribution of the aid you deliver? Because those people are reporting to me that some of it is getting resold for money, which is very worrying for, for my friends yeah. from, from Ukraine. Is there a black market there, Bruce? Are you running into that? I mean, Absolutely. We, we know uh, there is, but are you running into it? Yeah. Uh, we've we've heard about it a little bit. We haven't had too much of a problem. We're giving it either uh, directly to people ourselves or or directly through the city and government agencies uh, who are responsible for distributing it or other Ukrainian um, nonprofits that we're working with. So I feel pretty confident in what um, we're doing. But it is, as 
as you pointed out, it, it is a very common problem, and especially anytime when you're when you do what we do, which is give things away for free, um, someone will try to grab it and then use it to resell, right, and make a profit. Um, so we're we're uh, sensitive to that, aware that it's happening, and uh, trying to make sure that at least our efforts are going directly into the hands of the folks that need it. Right. So you're not having uh, you haven't found that you've had a big problem with that yet. But have you heard of other people having this problem in your region? Because being where you are, you must. This is a crossroads. You must be getting, I would imagine, uh, traffic and ebb and flow of information coming from all corners of the country. Uh, is that the case? And and what are you, what are you so, hearing, generally? Well, uh, so I will say that you know one of the things we're hearing is that uh, the when we talk to some certain people and officials, they tell us, hey, we are really glad. Um, that you're working with, the, that you're not just doing this on your own, that you're working with the local government because, um, you know, for entrance, for uh, example, the governor here this of this oblast, like, she asked us that question specifically, and we said, yeah, we're working through your warehouse um, to help with distribution. And then they really like that answer because they register and keep track of all the goods that come in that are distributed because of, and they do it very specifically because of this problem where you know, they don't want to be uh, hijacked and resold. Yeah. Do you, do you, have you run in, uh, to a lot of military there? Cause I was talking to Olgird yesterday without giving too much up there, uh, where he lives. We're not, gonna, we're not saying where he lives, but there is a lot of military, uh, rather hidden from view. And I think that's the case along the borders as well. Um, there are a lot of troops about, but you don't necessarily see them. But are you being in the war zone, so to speak, although you're not on the line, the front line, um, rather in the support areas, uh, are you seeing military? Uh, or is it rather as it is here? You don't see them very much, but you know they're there. Uh, interesting um, combination here of, of uh, you know, the people and the citizens of the city going on uh, about their daily business of, with life as usual, but with an elevated sense of uh, uh, heightened sense of security. Uh, obviously, you know, city buildings are, are sandbagged and guarded. Uh, you know, there's military checkpoints uh, at the city that are, uh, you know, they've set up defensive positions, um, sandbag, tank traps, you know, um, other obstacles they can pull across the road. And so you can see that there's a heightened sense of security and that they're definitely prepared, uh, more military out and about, but uh, not shockingly so, not alarmingly so, not, uh, it doesn't feel militant or uh, oppressive in any way. Uh, here we get air raid siren, sirens pretty much every day, but we haven't seen anything uh, strike or hear anything strike locally. Yeah, and you're speaking as a, as a former military man, with obviously with a lot of connections in the military, so you're good. That's why I asked you the question, because you'd be a credible observer of this. The uh, well, you say you're getting air raid sirens, uh, Old Garrett. I'm not forgetting about you. I want to talk about. We're coming up in the in the second half. I want to go over and speak about what Putin has been saying about Kaliningrad and about Poland, because there's a lot of interesting stuff, and we need to address that. And it's fascinating, sort of. Uh, topic moving on from where it was. We've we've discussed it a bit, in, you know, since the war started, but now there's more developments in that area. So in the second half after the break, we're going to come back, Olga, to you, uh, and we'll talk about that. Bruce too, but uh, I'll, you'll get a chance to to hold forth. Um, was I saying now? Uh, yeah, Bruce. The uh, what are you hearing from the front there? You're still a ways removed from it. But uh, is it a sense that, well, not much is happening to us here? We're just taking care of people. I mean, are they moving people from the front to you? Are there hospitals full of wounded? What's going on? Because, you know, the reason I ask is because we know that uh, there are quite a number of soldiers, even by Ukrainian estimates, being killed every day at this point, up to 1,000, between 1,000 and 2,000. Uh, are you seeing any of those people wounded, whatever, coming back your way? What's going on with that? Yes, the the uh, it's very real for them here. Um, but their sense of nationalism and their support, their sense of unity right now is at probably an all-time high, right? They're all very much behind this effort. 
um, and very supportive uh, of each other and of their government and and uh, supportive of pushing Russia back out of their territory. Uh, to your, it's interesting when we start asking questions around. We do support a few hospitals, right? And and what we've learned in doing this is we've asked those questions about the hospital systems being overwhelmed. And if you ask the state officials and the gov government, they they say they're fine. If you go to the hospitals and ask the the hospital workers, they say they're overwhelmed. Um, they, because uh, they've tried to uh, keep the military wounded, uh, the war wounded inside the military hospital system as much as possible. But what that's doing is that's pulling um, providers from the uh, civilian hospital side. So now that those that are left, so the nurses and doctors and the civilian side are, are overworked, uh, they're working uh, long hours, and they are, and they are still getting some uh, transfer of patients. Um, more civilian casualties than uh, than the military casualties, but uh, yeah, the system is definitely strained. Um, and we talked to a doctor last week um, who's going to be moving from his hospital here uh, back, joining the military and working in the in the military hospital system, where he'll be stationed, you know, further east. Uh, and he's doing it because he thinks it's the right thing to do, you know, to, to support his country. So that's a, a very interesting dynamic. It's something that we've been trying to to look into specifically in how can we support these hospitals with uh, uh, you know it's it's too hard. It, it, it's a long it's a pretty long leap to provide them to get them providers to come work here because of the you know having a translator and language barrier and you know medical terminology just makes that really difficult. But um, we we have brought um, civilian providers with us on these trips as volunteers and had them tour through the hospitals and observe and then make recommendations about, hey, we should try to get them this stuff, this equipment. Um, this would make their life a little easier. So in some of those cases, we've tried to source very specific things to support some of these hospitals. We know we could get a lot of American doctors to volunteer, uh, but right now they're telling us that they don't need them. They're telling you they don't need volunteer doctors now. Right. From, from other countries. Right. Do you yeah. think that is that true? Uh, I, I think they need them. Um, it's, it seems to me they must definitely need them. Yeah. If you need equipment, you uh, also need people. That's the way that goes. Yeah, yeah, but I believe it might be a real strain on the on the resources when the, you need a translator as well. Well, that's true. Yeah. Uh, there is a communication. Because it's then you have a communication problem. It would be easier to organize this kind of help in Poland, I guess. The, the Good problem point. in Poland is that uh, they still have the we've had we've run down this road actually, uh, and the problem in Poland is that they still have the requirement for medical licensing. Um, yeah. yeah where, whereas in Ukraine, they don't care right now. I mean, uh, they're they're they just need the help. But like I said, there's a little bit of a different message depending on who you talk to uh, about what the need is and what they're willing to take. Um, I think they're willing to look at uh, more uh, doctors, providers, EMTs on the front in the east, like in ambulances. There'll be more. What I've under my understanding is they're more willing to take those uh, that assistance there, but they don't necessarily want it in the hospitals back here. And, and to your point, you know. It, it, it almost it's almost worse if you if you give them a doctor for two weeks and then take them away, right? Um, right. Okay. They, so you've yeah. created an expectation that you you can't then fulfill, and uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's something about limiting expectations which is very important in these situations, and uh, not promising too much, right? Yeah. Right. You got to be able to deliver, and you don't want to. You don't want to create a capacity that, that then you have to take away, right? Where we bring in three or four providers, and you have a surge capacity at that hospital, and you're doing more and seeing more patients. And then what happens when you pull that rug out, right? Like those guys can't maintain it forever, or uh, where we're ro rotating through physicians and we get different specialties, which you know that's kind of the case a lot of the times. Is it matters who you bring, <laughs> what their specialty is. So absolutely, thank you, Bruce. We got to go to a break. We'll be right back with Olga de Ujim. Whoa. <laughs> wow. The producer just whispered in my ear that was okay, not bad, which is good for my confidence. And with Bruce Roberts, CEO of uh, August Mission. Be right back after this break. Stay with us.
Indeed, some roads, in fact, quite a lot of roads lead to Poland these days. Um, let's come back and start the second part of the show. I want to talk about what's going on between Russia and uh, Lithuania and Poland regarding Kaliningrad and Svalky Corridor and a bit of history. Ogird, could you yes. could you bring us up to date on this? Uh, uh, give us a snapshot or a bit more than that, a series of snapshots for our viewers about why this stuff is important, because there's a lot behind this that people may not be aware of. Well, you just mentioned in our talk, uh, cutting. And it's not only cutting, that's a, that's a whole series of events from starting from the slaughter of Prague in nine, uh, late 18th, 18th century. And there is a lot of grievances and bad blood between Poland and Russia. Uh, Poland was occupied by Russian, part of Poland was occupied by Russian forces for like 123 years. And then uh, there was the first Soviet-Polish war. Then there was the invasion of Poland, of Poland together with Germany. I really like the Russian view of the history when they don't really notice that they were allies with Adolf Hitler. Yeah, that's not a great uh, thing on your resume, is it? Isn't it? No. And, 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 and another thing that is really worrisome for me is like, do you remember the first, one of the main points of Adolf Hitler when he was starting the war in Poland? It was the road to Danzig. Right. The corridor to Danzig. Yeah. Now we're seeing pretty much similar situation with Kaliningrad. When the Russians are insisting of, of having a direct access to Kaliningrad, but kind of by kind of the trans territorial, I don't know what, or through our territories or Lithuania. Yes, and right now the problem is that Lithuania has said no transport through yeah. our country of any banned materials. And that's the trick. If you read the Russian sources, they say, oh, Lithuania banned all the transport of yeah. Kaliningrad. It's a blatant lie. Yeah. Another, another in a long line. Of um, course. I, I wonder how Putin expects anyone to believe anything he says at this point, except for the Russian apologists, but uh, of which there are plenty. I mean, you know, it is sad, I mean, you know, the whole situation, of course. But beyond that, you have to be a bit grown up and look at what's really happening. Now, Katyn. Bruce, are you familiar with Katyn and uh, the story of it, the massacre there? Uh, I'm not, really. I'm learning right now. Good. So okay. Learning. That's what I thought, because you're a man over here doing a lot of great stuff. And this is complicated history. And I think we got we got to throw it over to the professor here well, to bring it's us. Actually, it's my family history, so I can tell you something. Please, give, give us a really good story about that, that for Bruce and for our viewers. And for me and during too. The, yeah. During the Second World War, when the Germany invaded Poland from the west, 1st September, the Russian troops invaded Poland from the east, of course, under the guise of uh, freeing the nations of eastern Poland oppressed by Polish government. And, of course, parts of the troops were giving up. Uh, parts of the, some of the troops were surrendering to Russians, and all the officers were rounded up and sent to Russian territories. Actually, both one of my grandfathers, my mother's father, was taken with uh, with those people, and the other, my uncle grandfather, which was brother of my my my, my grandfather, was taken to Ostashkov. And in Ostashkov, Stanisław Uziembo was killed by Russian. A lot of Polish officers were killed by Russians, and the Russians tried to blame that crime on German troops. And Germans were trying to use it as propaganda by saying that Russians are bad. And there was a whole crisis during the Second World War when Polish government in, in, in England was dealing with it and trying to uh, not break up the alliance between allies and, and Soviet Union of the time. That was a big, big problem at that time. Anyway. Interesting story is my mother's father, who actually managed with his friends to kill the Russian guards, escape, and they walked through entire Ukraine back to Podlasie, where they organized a partisan oh, underground army unit. Where did they escape from exactly? 
Uh, they, they escaped somewhere in far east Ukraine. They didn't know exactly. Right. From the train, they killed the guards. They uh, unchained the train. They jumped from, and they came back on foot. All the way. Now, All the way. what about Katyn specifically? Because it's a double-edged sword, this Katyn, because it was the where they murdered the thousands and thousands of Polish officers. officers. And, and, uh, was it only officers? Were there intellectuals there, too? Well, mostly officers, but mostly you know, officers. those were the volunteer officers, so some of them were just simply, most of the time, intellectuals, and they were just slaughtered. They were executed with a single shot in the back of the head. Yeah, very and some methodically. Them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very methodically, and, yeah. and, and a lot of people. 20,000, yeah. was it? Something? We don't really know the number, but yeah. the Russians, are, for a moment, they, they freed the, the archives, so it probably is around 20,000. Yeah. But now they're claiming, oh, that this is Germans again that did it. Right. And, uh, and, and the trick is that the, 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 same plan, the same place was also place of mass executions of Russians as well. Right. And they, as you said, they just recently removed the Polish flag. But frankly speaking... Why would they do that? Why wouldn't they? But why would they do it at this time? Let's just, let's just oh, because speculate. Just to show, just, because just to show that it is not Russian guilt, it has nothing to do with Poland, and Poland is bad and is a fascist country, and we were just executing probably fascist uh, officers. That's how they say it. Even though at that time they were allied <laughs> with fascists. Uh, sorry, Nazis. Let's keep the vocabulary straight. Yeah, let's keep it. I mean, you know, they call a fascist a fascist and a Nazi a Nazi. It's very yeah. important. And a communist a communist. Okay. So when, I guess the point is also, there was a famous, the famous plane crash of the Polish uh, yeah. authorities and, and the, I, the president I and his that wife. It's a mistake for me to celebrate that in, 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 in Russia. For me. To, to sell it. Yes. Have yeah, I that. know. I thought about that because it's like you're celebrating death. What can that lead to in Russia where they already hate you, except yes. another possible accident, you know? Yes, and they managed to split the polar, whatever it is, just a crash, a stupidity, or uh, uh, as other people say, it was uh, not accidental. Still, it managed to split the Polish political platform. The Polish political scene in half, and it's really bad for Poland. Very bad for Poland, I agree, and very good for the Russians it, to spin it that way. Very clever. Yes. It's diabolical, but true. You know about the plane crash and was uh, ten years ago, right? When the president died, and a lot of Polish high ups, yeah, uh, people also died in that plane crash. It's uh, it's. Uh, they they were going to Katyn to commemorate. They were going to celebrate the uh, commemorate. Let's say you don't really celebrate execution. such. You yeah. don't celebrate it, but commemorate. <laughs> yeah. You would say commemorate. Little, so, yeah, little different right. word. It's not really. A, I mean, there's there's no dancing so, around yeah, the maypole. Right. Yeah, but. Uh, so this is a a, mom, uh, a, 20, uh, a moment in 20th century Polish history and in the history of the war, which is exceedingly important because it shows the depth of lies, deception that was going on between uh, that the Russians and the Germans were using. I mean, it really is another great example of of the treachery between those the, that those two countries practice with each other, with other countries, and with their own people. That's also the interesting part, because remember they were occupying Poland at the time. So uh, the everyone knows the Germans committed many murders in Poland, but it's very important to realize that uh, the Russians also were very happy well, to knock people off. Nobody remembers the anti-Polish Russians in so uh, actions in uh, Soviet Russia when they were eliminating Polish people in an anti-Polish campaign. The, the 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 resettlement of Polish people and sending Polish people to Kazakhstan, nobody remembers that. I, I still it's still shocking to me that both on Russian and Amer uh, and Western side of the discussion, we still talk about perhaps Russian rapes in Germany. But what were they doing in so-called freeing of Poland? Nobody remembers about that. Very good point. Very good point. Let's go back to okay. So now we've got a little background. Yes. of this, uh, it's very confusing background, and where do you get into the, the post-war uh, different factions in Poland and who they were allied with? 
uh, and, and not only in Poland, some of the other countries in Central Europe, but certainly Poland, very, very interesting. There's a great movie which suggests the spirit of the time uh, with regard to these different factions. It's called Ashes and Diamonds by Andrzej Wajda. It's uh, with an absolutely superb performance by, by uh, uh, Zbigniew... Uh, what's, uh, Zbig Cybulski. Cybulski, yeah. Zbigniew yeah. Cybulski, the James Dean of Poland. I think he's a better actor than James Dean. Absolutely riveting figure. And uh, uh, unforgettable movie. It's one of Francis Ford Coppola's favorite movies, apparently. Uh, but it details this post-war uh, difficulty in, in uh, dis finding out exactly who was on whose side. The allegiances were very skewed, to say the least. So it's a complicated history out here. Now, part well, of that is because... It's repeating itself. If, if you look at the... You can call it Eastern faction and Western faction. And as I discussed with some of my friends, some of the people say, oh, uh, the, mm, the government in Poland right now, it's a bit, a, a bit like Orbán's, a bit like Russians, a bit, a, a bit of Putin is in their ways. But on the other hand, the, opposite, the opposition... Well, we cannot forget also that they were they were pretty much doing what the Germans are doing, and they're really putting us on the gas needle, as some people say. How do you mean on the gas needle? A gas needle, because we are, you know, we are attached to the needle just like a drug addict is attached. Uh, ah, attached. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Actually, that's an illusion that George Bush, the second George Bush, made too. Good point. Um, we're addicted, yeah, to various things, yeah. Various things, not just oil, but and also to, to conflict. And Merkel is one of the really blame for it. Yes, let's, uh, let's move on to the Zawałki Corridor. Now, Bruce, uh, the Zawałki Corridor, of course, is the area between, um, it's the 60 mile, si sorry, 60 kilometer, 40 miles, of a uh, border between Lithuania and Poland, which is anchored on either side by Belarus, the corner of Belarus and the Lithuanian-Polish border, and Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad. People forget. We keep talking about it, but it doesn't, the penny is not dropping, I think, with a lot of people, um, because it is confusing that Russia has its own province, in fact, the most popular province in Russia, apparently, is actually in Poland, which is another wonderful contradiction, isn't it? Um, but it presents a big problem. Now, what's the problem of the Savalki Corridor, uh, Ogier? Well, I would, I would rather ask Bruce, because as I understand, he's former military, because it's, it's very close to Belarus. It's actually flat land, and I don't think it will be easy to, to keep it the moment the Russians attack. Well, this is the point, because it's only... Uh, have you thought much about this problem, Bruce, or uh, explained it to many people? Because it's really come into the news, and I find a lot... Of, it sort of blindsides a lot of people, especially if they're very focused, like you are, in, in providing aid and, and very hands-on kind of stuff. Are you familiar with it at all, that situation? Uh, honestly, I haven't had a look at it strategically, um, not a deep dive. You know, I've only heard mention of it. And so, I, you know, I, I'd have to look at it more from a uh, military standpoint to determine, I, I think, uh, have a good answer on, on uh, what it might mean for them uh, to be able to hold it or uh, how easy it would be for them to lose it. And the, maybe the second and third order effects of what would happen either way. Yeah, the, the problem is uh, that you have... Kaliningrad is an armed camp. It is filled with tanks and soldiers. With It's the headquarters of the Baltic Fleet, and they have nuclear capable, uh, these Iskander missiles, which are very fast missiles, okay? These are the lethal ones. They could attack in a couple of minutes and take out, I think maybe even less than a minute, Warsaw could evaporate, okay? This is what we're talking about. Well, they actually talked about attacking London from Kaliningrad. Well, they could, couldn't they? Russian TV. Yeah, they could, couldn't they? And so there yeah. is a, a part of Russia that the Russians think is the best part of Russia in Poland, okay? And then you've got this... We drove up there. I went with Vova 
and we did a, some segments for Poland Daily Travel going right along this area and talking about the history. It was like six, seven parts, uh, sort of 10-minute segments. Talking about the history, we started right at the bottom by the border of Lithuania. And you know, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but I even experienced this recently, is if you go to the border anywhere along the border by Belarus, any of those small towns, if you don't live there, you ain't supposed to be there. They are off limits to anyone yeah. who's not military or local. And that this means you and me and me. <laughs> you and me and, and Bruce and whatever. So uh, that's very interesting. This is a whole new development. It started with the, the, the Belarusian uh, red uh, false flag operation of sending people across claiming they were legitimate immigrants last summer. Started with that. And then, of course, with the war and the, and the buildup in Belarus, attacks from Belarus on Ukraine, it's become, and with the Savalki Corridor problem, it's become uh, oh, a the Russians are really steeping up the, 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 the discourse right now. They're, they're starting, you know, you're saying, oh, they really stopped any transport to Kaliningrad, which is not true, but they want to create an image within, within Russia that Russia is under threat, and everything we do is against the fascist, that's the word they use, against the fascist governments of Europe. Actually, gay fascist, mind you. Gay and fascist? Yeah. That's not good. That's not good. It'd be called, yeah, you know that, 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 the I don't, the, I don't the, think gay the, people popular, like being called fascist. What? You know the popular <laughs> name for Europe in Russia? It's gay Europe. Gay Europa. Really? Yeah. Good Lord, yeah. they're taking this, this Viking Mongol thing a step too far. Let's throw it over to Bruce now. Uh, Bruce, what do you plan to achieve in your last uh, few days over there? You'll be over there till the middle of the week or something, right? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, actually, Will. Uh, we've got a, a big initiative we're trying to pull off here in the next few days, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and that is that um, we identified an opportunity to uh, purchase homes for widows. Um, when I say widows, I mean their families, those that don't have a home uh, from coming from the East uh, and have lost a spouse as well, or you know, a potential bread, breadwinner. Uh, so we're working with the city to identify appropriate candidates, and we're actually buying houses for these widows and putting them in there. Uh, so that's our new initiative. We have the goal of raising enough money to buy 10 houses over the next two months, and uh, we already got the money to to, to buy one. So we're gonna we're learning the system uh, in order to purchase a piece of property and uh, establishing ourselves as a, an entity here so that we can do so. And we are going to purchase our first home uh, tomorrow, and then in conjunction with the uh, city officials, we're going to hand the keys over. And uh, when you say you're pur purchasing a home, how, how big is it? What is it? What uh, is? It, does it have facilities? Is it just to describe what it's going to be used for exactly? So, uh, is it a I model idea? You want to replicate what what's going on? So it's a single family home and what, what we found that if you go outside the city a little bit, you know, 30, between 30 and 50 kilometers to some of these rural uh, uh, villages, you can buy a home um, on a small plot of land, I would say about an acre, um, for six or seven thousand dollars. Wow. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a small house, probably, uh, I would say in, I have to do the conversion here for meters, but I don't know, 300 square meters. Like that. Not bad. Maybe. It's yeah. actually big. That's actually pretty big. <laughs> Thousand square feet, somewhere in that neighborhood, right? Thousand um, square feet, yeah. That's pretty big. Yeah. yeah. So I would say like a single family home out in the country a little bit, not too far removed. Yeah. Um, has enough land uh, for at least an acre, if not more. And you can get them in these rural uh, communities really cheap. So uh, we thought, you know what, why not? Let's just, if we can do it, let's just buy the house and then start giving them to deserving families that uh, don't have a place to live. And ha that's, and, a, uh, that's like the Jimmy Carter idea, only you're not building them. It's probably cheaper just to buy them than it would be to build them, right? It is, Zach, 100%. Yeah, we asked that question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's a great idea. And are you going to continue to try to do this for people? You're going to continue? Yeah, we'll see how... 
Yeah. Like I said, we want to get 10 uh, in the next two months. If we can get by 10 and, and hand them over, that's our goal. Uh, and if it, if it, you know, if it grabs some traction back home, if people can get behind this and we can successfully fundraise for it, um, and uh, it goes over well here as far as they think it's a good idea, and this, you know, the city supports us, um, we want to do more. That is the first yeah. thing I've heard of anybody doing that. That's extremely useful. Did you uh, think about providing useful. them transport? Sorry? Uh, because uh, that's something we met in, in Poland with the refugees. Sometimes when they're put in the, those smaller places, when there are houses available, they complain they have problems with commuting to work. With the transport between house and work, yeah, home and work, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a very legitimate concern, and so that's why we want to find the right families and make sure we ask them these questions before we just do it. And that's what we're working to identify because, you know, two of the things that you brought up that great point about transportation, but also, you know, is there somewhere for them to work there? Can they find a job and or just stick them out there with no way to support themselves or get to a job? Um, so we want to kind of ask those questions and make sure we don't put them in a worse situation. But well, that's about all we've got time for. Brilliant work. Brilliant work. Thank you. Isn't that wonderful? I want, thank you guys, both of you gentlemen, for joining us. You, you know, appreciate it as usual. Olga, it's good to see you again. Just saw you yesterday. Good to see you again uh, on Skype this time. And Bruce, saw you in the studio last week. Thanks for allowing us to follow up with you and the important work you're doing. And this is a kind of, uh, I suppose, a uh, can be a parable for other smaller organizations like yours that are not attached to uh, governments that are doing amazing things, simply. I don't know what else to say. I'm, I, I'm in awe of the kind of work that you and people like you have been doing, and, and in Afghanistan before. I think it's, you know, I can't speak highly enough of it. So thank you very much, Bruce Roberts, the CEO of August Mission, who is now in uh, uh, Mielnitsk. Mielnitsky, yeah, Mielnitsky. Is that was that close, Olgerd? You'll be my language professor, and <laughs> and I want to thank Olgerd. Olgerd, for being with us. Very good. Ah, you see. I was just fooling. I knew it all the time. Like heck I did. Okay, folks. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I don't know. I enjoyed that show a lot. I think uh, it's very impressive. Uh, very impressive, Olgerd's intellect, and very impressive, uh, Bruce's action. And it takes both to tango. Thanks for watching. You're looking good. Stay that way.